Divine Truth Events These are events and presentations by Jesus and Mary. This presentation is part of the general discussion series. And it is a question and answer session from people in Philadelphia. Presented by Mary Magdalene and Jesus on the 20th of October 2013 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, USA. This is session two, part one. All right. Okay. Welcome, everyone, today. Uh, we had a great sleep last night, which is, yay. We're feeling like a little bit more like our normal selves, so I'm glad about that. And I'm starting off this morning because um, of a question that Dan posed near the end yesterday, which was about some of my experiences with um, living with Jesus. And I suppose I had a little pray baby, about it. Baby, can I just... Can all of those sitting at the back, if you could all come down a bit closer, it's going to make it a lot easier for the microphones. And we haven't chosen our microphone handlers yet. Liz is going to do it for oh, us. Liz yeah. is going to do one. And we need one for the other side. If Katerina, yeah. Katerina, you're happy to do just... If It's just easier if everyone comes a bit closer, then the microphone handlers don't have to run as far. Yeah, that'd be great. And can I encourage you while I'm, while I'm speaking to just... Pitch in with any questions that you might have about what I'm talking about. I brought my, uh, in my voluminous jacket, I have my hanky <laughs> because I'm, I'm quite emotional about this topic. So um, anytime you want to chime in and clarify anything that I've said or um, take me to task on a point or really find out what I mean, please do it because um, when I get emotional, I'm a bit shaky and I tend to rush things. So I'm... Um, doing my best to slow down and hang out with you guys and tell you a little bit about my story and what it's been like, how love has really changed me. Because I feel that after six years, love has definitely changed me. And a lot of the uh, emotions that I've gone through are things that I see reflected in many people around us all of the time different issues that I see many people avoiding or that they haven't quite faced yet are things that I know that I've come fully into contact with and seen within myself. I haven't always moved completely through all of them, <laughs> but as some of you know, I can be quite direct about the things that I, I really know are there and um, that have really, by facing them, have helped me grow a lot. Uh, so perhaps, I know I don't know many of you that well, and there's a few of you in the room that have perhaps known me for about the time that I've known AJ. Cornelius and Katerina are probably the only two. But I thought for the benefit of the rest of you, I might give you a little snapshot of who I was six years ago. Um, because it's someone quite different, I think, to who I am today. And I'm hoping I'm going to keep changing. But six years ago, I was a qualified occupational therapist. And I worked in the area of health and rehabilitation with children and adults. And I'd done that for about 10 years. And right before I met AJ, for about four and a half years, I was living abroad. I lived for about three years in Lebanon, two and a half in a Palestinian refugee camp. I was volunteering my time there with um, children and adult refugees, looking at health and their life, quality of life and their life roles. And I was pretty passionate about that. And at the time, I had started a master's degree in international health and development. And I thought I had my life sorted. This is how I was going to spend the rest of my life. I was going to be in Africa or the Middle East or in some part of Asia, working with kids with disabilities and refugees, or even in my own country because we have a lot of issues surrounding people who, excuse me, who are asylum seekers. And, and I thought, yep, I know what I'm doing with the rest of my life. And um, I, during this time that I lived overseas, I had a lot of experiences with injustice. I was seeing injustice everywhere and I was very passionate about changing that on the planet. And I felt at the time, even though I wasn't very aware of it, 
there was a lot of rage in me about it and a lot of grief. I was feeling like, how can this be? How can we let this happen on our planet? And actually having lived in a refugee camp and lived in exactly the same way as people have been living uh, in Lebanon, there's about... I lived with 20,000 people in one square kilometre in kind of like what you would call a ghetto. So people for 50 years had been um, living in this situation generation upon generation. And, and I was feeling... I had all of this stuff inside of me, but I had no concept of what it was to feel an emotion, <laughs> of what it was to actually be humble. So I just thought I needed to act differently to change the world. And so when I met AJ, I was quite a, an arrogant young woman. I thought I knew what the world needed. I didn't want to live in my home country anymore because I was judging all of them so badly for not caring about what else was happening for people in the rest of the world. And I also had a lot of feelings about women don't need men, we can do it all. We, you know, and men are just there really because probably one day I'm going to want to have a baby. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't believe in love. I don't believe in a real sense. I don't believe that happy endings ever happen in relationships. I would like to think that. I used to tell myself that I would like to think that. But I couldn't watch a romantic film without scorning it. I, I couldn't sit through it. When I met AJ, his favourite film was The Notebook. And I couldn't even watch it without going, oh, you know, this is the, the level of kind of emotion that was inside of me about love, which I actually feel really sad about now because it was covering a lot of grief inside of me. Um, I had all this rage and a lot of my girlfriends had exactly, like my friends who were girls, had a lot of the same feelings as me. We were career women, we didn't need men and we had relationships with men but during those relationships, we were very condescending in a lot of ways to the men that we were with. I also attracted a lot of men who um, were like my dad. <laughs> they had a lot of sadness. They had a lot of feelings of wanting to um, barter with women. They, they were kind of... I wanted to fix them emotionally, just like I'd done... You know, had this role in, in my relationship with my dad. And I also, because of a lot of the first century emotions that I was suppressing hard, I was suppressing them really hard, and a lot of them involved shame and sexual terror, I also attracted some guys into my life who were quite sexually deviant and wanted... They were doing things in their life or had done things in their life that were quite um, sexually overt or um, immoral. And I unbeknownst to me, I felt quite comfortable in that, even though it was quite um, emotionally dangerous for me. I felt comfortable in that because it helped me avoid the deep level of shame I had. I felt like in the company of this guy, I don't feel ashamed. In the company of guys who had more morals and were, who were more um, into fidelity, I actually felt a lot of unworthiness and I never really accomplished having a relationship with a guy who I felt... Um, really respected me. But of course I didn't feel any of this when I met AJ. This is just how I was living, thinking, I've got life sorted out, you know, I, I, and I'm a pretty good person. I had this arrogant kind of idea that, well, I'm someone in the world who gives a shit. You know, other people don't. I'm someone who wants to dedicate my life to fixing everything. And... Um, yeah, that was pretty hard for me. Eventually, I've come to see the arrogance in that position. Um, I had a lot of judgment coming out of me towards my brothers and sisters who were just living their life and doing their thing and in the, in the way that their, their family had raised them to feel was a good thing to do as well. So that's a snapshot of me. Is there anything you feel I've missed out? No, I don't think so. I think yeah. that's pretty close. Yeah. So that's the me who bowled on home to my parents' living room, um, fresh off a plane from Lebanon, um, to listen to this guy who they'd been listening to speak. And there's a lot to the story of what happened, and I don't need to tell you exactly how we came together, because the point of this story, if you like, or this um, sharing, is to tell you about what it was like for me in terms of love. And what I, I want to share with you what I thought love was when I met AJ 
and then what ha what's happened to me since and what it's like what it's been like and what it continues to be like to experience being loved by him and by God. And this is a bit where I get really emotional, so that's good. <laughs> okay, so good morning, everyone. Come in. <laughs> Let's talk about what I felt love was when I'm... So six years ago. <laughs> Excuse the handwriting because I'm shaking... So this is what I believed love to be. And I see this, as I said, I see this reflected in a lot of people that we meet now. Still a lot of you are walking around feeling like love is, when this set of things happen, I feel this, this good emotion and that is love. And it's not always the case. So what I believed love to be. Probably the major thing that I believed about love was that it involved barter. I, as in, I'll do something good for you and then you'll do something good for me and that proves that we love each other. And when I do something good for you, you should do something good for me because that's what love would do. So it was really these two things um, of, say, barter... And sacrifice. So, do you guys know what I mean by that? Can you relate to that? <laughs> yeah, a lot of us have grown up in families where we where barter is is the way you do things, and sacrifice is, as AJ pointed, uh, sort of briefly mentioned yesterday, um, about how we view sacrifice as proof of love, that if we, if we deny ourselves, then it shows that we, that we are loving someone. And I very much had that idea that I, in order to love someone, I should sacrifice my true desires, what I really wanted, and that would prove to them that I was loving them, that I, loved, that I honoured them more than me, and I thought that's what love did. Okay. What else? I also had a really big idea about emotion. Uh, even though I didn't really understand this intellectually, a lot of my ideas about what love was were based around taking away unpleasant emotions. If someone loves me, they will comfort and soothe me away from my fear and my grief. That's what love does. That's what I felt. So, comforting... How do you think I got on when I, when I met Jesus? <laughs> That's what I'll talk about next. <laughs> so comforting and soothing emotions, particularly emotions of fear and grief. I, I felt like I'd grown up in a situation where if one person in the family felt those things then everyone else should rush to their aid, share in that feeling and do whatever we could to take it away. So sharing in emotion was also another big thing that I felt about what love does. So if you're feeling something, then I should feel it with you. That's what love does. Does anyone relate to that one, this sharing in emotions? Yeah, yeah. It's a big thing that I feel a lot of us try to do with each other and more than that, we try to get others to do it with us. <laughs> we we, we want to tell the big story so everyone goes, oh, and then we feel validated and it kind of helps us stay away from how confronting that emotion is to just feel on our own. And probably, I can't believe I left this to last because it's probably what I should have put first, was about approval. I felt that someone who loved, loved me would approve of me. And my family had approved of me for 
when I met Jesus again, I was 29, I think. So for 29 years, I'd had a lot of approval. I, there'd been a lot of barter involved in that I needed to do a certain amount of certain things, fill a certain kind of a role. But when I did, I got heat with approval. And within that approval, there was no challenge to the, the parts inside of me that were not loving. I just got approval for doing a certain set of things and I could say certain words and no one was ever challenging me on whether those words translated into action or whether those words that were accompanied by feelings that matched them. Do you know what I mean by that? I could say, oh, it's okay, I'm really sorry. I'm sorry I did that, I feel really bad. And then everything would go away, I'd get approval again. It didn't matter if I was really sorry or if I wasn't going to do it again. The, the thing that was accepted was me saying, I feel really bad about myself and I'm really sorry. So even my kind of a self-punishing um, treatment of myself was rewarded with approval. My parents took that to mean, oh, she is sorry, she's punishing herself. And let's move on. We'll give her some approval again. Now, obviously... They responded in that way because of the way that they were raised and they're the way that they view love. But what it did for me when I was attempting to be more sincere, if we fast forward a little bit when I, and we'll talk about how I had to challenge all of these things, but when it came to actually really looking at myself and really being challenged with some truth, I would often revert to self-punishment in order to try and show that I was sorry because this is the way that I thought that when you really love, that's what you do. Um, and, of course, that's not really what love does. But I had no idea about this. And when I'm pointing these things out to you, understand that six years ago, even though I couldn't describe these things, this is what I would have sworn was love. And this is how I responded to people. When they did this set of things with me, I felt they loved me. And when I thought, I want to love this person, I did all of these things with them. So I'll just add my approval at the bottom. Oops. So in that, I, ne I wanted approval from others. And here, I probably want to draw a distinction between approval and acceptance. Because it is possible to just accept someone as they are. In fact, that's a quality of love. But we don't have to approve of everything within that person when we love them, do we? Can you, under, can you see the difference between those two things? Because actually what love does is challenges the errors inside of us and challenges those parts of us that are not truthful or, or not loving, but still accepts us and allows us to be who we are. But there's an immediate challenge. When there's approval, there's no challenge. It's like, you're great. No, you're really great. That's, what I, that's the message I would get from my parents when I did these kinds of things. And, and so then there was never a challenge inside of me of the things that weren't actually that loving or great. Because this, this barter and this set of... It's probably like fulfilling a role. Is what my whole family unit accepted as love. Now, when I met Jesus again, and I often call him AJ because I, I, cause I always think I met Jesus and then... All this other stuff happened, and then he was AJ, so I met AJ, but he's really Jesus. <laughs> Does that make sense? And sometimes I use it to differentiate which century we're talking about. But when I met him again, um, immediately, because there was such a strong pull towards him, even though I didn't really like that pull, <laughs> it frightened me a lot. Not because I felt like I was being controlled, but because I felt like... I can't do all these things seamlessly anymore. <laughs> and I'm actually not receiving a lot of these things that I, I was receiving. 
from my family, I'm feeling really frightened about what's happening. I, I, my heart is pulling me in one direction, but in order to go in this direction, I immediately lost approval. Like, not just approval from my family, I mean kind of globally, from my friends, from my, my professional colleague, from, from my profession, from everything that I was doing. Suddenly, here's the, here's the um, possibility of losing all approval. And I didn't understand how, like, now I can feel, of course, it was all conditional and it wasn't love. But at that time, I felt like I'm, now there's no love for me anywhere in the world. And also, I, could, I wasn't sensitive at that time to the love that was coming towards me from God and from my soulmate. So let's, let's talk a little bit about what that was like, how, how my soulmate responded to me attempting to love him in this way and how he challenged these things within me. And this, is, this was really six years ago, even though it wasn't very pretty, in that I was quite angry a lot of the time. This is the first challenge I had to, to consider what is love really anyway? What is it like to be loved and to give love? Because before then I hadn't even questioned any of these things. And can you guys relate to, to these things that I'm pointing out? Y yeah. I feel like when I was going through all of this, I thought it's just me. I've just got all this messed up idea of what love is. And then as I've worked through it, I go, oh, actually, it's kind of a global problem, isn't it? We, we all, a lot of us share these ideas about what, what love is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so immediately that I met Jesus, he challenged... And this is probably both centuries we're talking now. It, it played out a little differently in the first century, but I had a lot of this stuff going on except maybe a little bit darker in the first century. Um, and he, he responded in much the same way at both times. So we kind of met and we tried to have a relationship. First a friendship and then it quickly became romantic. Um, and then it quickly kind of stopped being romantic. <laughs> and I, I actually... I left AJ uh, in the first year that we knew each other. We kind of formed a re relationship. And then I went through a period of just telling him I didn't have any feelings for him and I didn't love him, I didn't want to be around him, I didn't believe anything. And a lot of that was a product of my complete terror about, what was, about this lack of approval that was happening in the rest of my life. But a lot of it was also because he wasn't meeting my addictions to tell me that this, this approval thing was a big addiction. And maybe I need to give that a whole separate point, which was I thought love was meeting your addictions. When someone made you feel good and, like, did what you wanted, that's, I thought that's love, that's what you do. So, meeting addictions. So, while we struggled to commence a relationship and came back in and out of having a relationship, this idea of needing a role and being able to barter with my mate was so ingrained. And when I met AJ, he didn't need me for anything. I mean, nothing. He, did, he could cook, he could clean, he could build a computer, he could fix a car, he, could, uh, he was very bright, he had a relationship with God, he, he was not emotionally needy in the slightest and I actually preferred my men to be quite emotionally needy because then I you know, felt like I had a, a good, I, I felt more secure. He's not going to leave me, he needs me. Um, and then if I could mother him a little bit... <laughs> by cooking and taking care of some domestic tasks, even though the strong, independent, you know, 20th century woman would have thought that that's not really what... I, I would never have admitted that to myself, but I had a series of relationships where I did do a lot of the domestic tasks and I felt quite comfortable because I felt like it gave me a role and I felt like I was needed, and I could even be a little bit condescending to the poor old male who couldn't really look after himself. <laughs> and, 
And also, if I had something I could give him, then it was okay to ask something, of he, uh, some, something that he should give me. You know, he should give me some security, help me avoid my fears, make me feel protected in social situations. Um, so I, I was comfortable with that. I wanted something that I could give so I could demand some things back. And vice versa. I was okay with having some people demand, having the guy demand some things of me, as long as he would give me things. It didn't work. I tried, and for for the first year, I would not even cook anything because I was in such a passive aggressive rage that he could cook better than me, you know. <laughs> So he made all the meals for the first year because I was, and completely, I was not self-aware about this, guys. I was just acting out all of this kind of stuff that I didn't even want to see about myself. Uh, it took me a long time to actually really face these things. And I mean face them emotionally. It's very different to face them emotionally than us just having a chat about it today. It's good to have a talk about it today because it increases our awareness, but actually coming to face emotionally where this stuff is playing out in our lives, that's a whole other step. It's like saying, oh, I'm not going to barter with you anymore, but at the same time, there's a whole lot of expectations that we have that our partner give us things and we should be able to do things. And even though we might even do a, I do a rudimentary, I'll just change this set of behaviours, if that emotion is still playing out, either we get very angry because our partner listens and stops bartering or it just plays on and on in our relationship until something happens to really expose just how much barter is going on. That's what happens in a, in a general codependent relationship. Dan, you had a question? Yep. Yep. Katarina, or Lisa might bring it to you. Yeah, yeah. So I'm loving this, first of all. This is awesome. Thank you. What I'm really curious about is, so there you were in this beginning of this relationship. Yeah. You had all these things that you were expecting, needing, wanting from him. Yeah. So... I, What's really curious to me is how he, how AJ was able to be with you, love you, yeah. give to you, but also with, without expecting anything in return. Like, it's like, that's almost like blows my mind. Yeah. That, because I know as a man, if I'm trying to woo a woman or attract a woman, you know, I'm hoping that she responds back. So to give that without needing anything or expecting anything, it just must have been getting you crazy. I, I don't know. So I, I, I want to just hear yeah. maybe how you, how he was able to give to you yeah. and, and, and still be in that really clear place. So I feel he was able to give to me because he's a highly developed individual who has dealt with a lot of his emotions. And during the time, he continued to deal with his emotions. He has a set of principles and standards that he will, not, he will not break. He will not do these things. And I wanted him to. Like, I was, I was trying to please him. I would do things that I thought that he wanted and he would say, Han, I can't let you do that because I can feel that you're just doing it because you want, you know, you want to please me. You don't even want to do it. You, I, we're not doing it. And I would be like, there is no way I can get this man to need me. I couldn't feel, I was not sensitive to the fact that he wanted me, that he just wanted me. I didn't, I didn't have the feeling that anyone would just want me. They need to they need, to need me. They need to, I need to fulfill a certain set of requirements or roles and then I'll feel secure. So I went through a whole period and I'm still going through a whole period <laughs> of feeling so vulnerable and insecure because there's nothing that I can do all he wants from me is me. And, and that's all he's ever wanted from me for six years. And I would try to present a facade. I would try to do things to please him. And he would go, I don't want this bit of you. This isn't even you. And that was so challenging. Um, and remains so because it's like a beautiful pain, if I can call it that, to have someone really want to see who you are and want that, even though it's not perfect, because I'd really like to be perfect, <laughs> um, but the real me isn't. 
And so, um, yeah, it was, it was kind of a crazy time because AJ had this set of principles that he wasn't going to break. He wasn't going to barter with me. Every time I tried to sacrifice for him, he would stop me. He would reject it. And he wasn't sacrificing himself, although probably, honey, you would say at a lot of times you did value you, me above you, didn't you? And that's something that you've had to work through. Yeah. Do, do, do you want to add? Or? Yeah. Um, if maybe Chris can put some camera there. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, the, the feeling I had was um, that I was probably... I, I had a, I've had a lot of issues to work through with regard of my, my own worth. And so initially... Um, there was the feeling coming out of me towards Mary that Mary was worth more to me than I was. And so Mary often tried to play on that. Um, yeah. But also I had to work through gaining more worth, even though... Um, and I've had to work through gaining more worth with others as well in the same way, even though everyone around me thinks that I've got less worth than they have. And in, and in fact, there's still a lot of people in our lives that feel that I have less worth than they have. Um, and, uh, and so I'm still working through the issues of worth. So for me, that's one of the issues that got triggered through this process. I had to work through issues of my personal worth and how little I valued myself in comparison to the value that I placed upon Mary. Yeah, yeah and keep in mind that I came into this relationship, I was very arrogant. You know, I felt like I knew how things should be done. I felt like... I wasn't self-aware about any of these things and I was used to being a little condescending to men. Maybe you'd say quite a lot. Well, there's uh, also the probably issue of even listening, wasn't there? Like, I would listen to you for hours about what you wanted to say and then... And Mary had struggled listening to me for five minutes, actually, um, and quite frequently for the first year or two. Um, Mary didn't listen to me at all about any, anything personal. So she would listen to me about, if I was discussing anything about herself, but as soon as I started to discuss anything about my personal emotions, Mary wouldn't listen to me at all. Yeah. And, uh, and so it, it took me a while to uh, gain the self-worth to say, no, hang on a sec, this is not on now, girl. Like, it's not on that you do this. It's yeah. not on that you uh, allow yourself. It's unethical for you to expect to have a relationship with somebody that they listen to everything you say and you listen to nothing they say about themselves, you know? And so it took me some time to work through some of those issues emotionally. It helped when we met because I was actually... Um, I, w I dealt with most of those issues within the first three months of meeting, actually. Yeah, because um, yeah, I was pretty open to dealing with my emotions by the time I met Mary. So, And Mary was quite uh, close towards me quite frequently in that period. So within the first three or four months, um, I attracted a lot of women who basically treated me the same way. So I, so I did deal with a lot of emotions, particularly initially, which stressed Mary out quite significantly as well. Yeah. yeah. I, um, and that's probably the thing that I wanted to say, that during all of this, um, I've watched AJ continue to grow. I mean, this is something that happened while I was doing... I was, like, holding on the grim death to all of these things that I wanted love to be. Meanwhile, he was so humble. He didn't even, you know, he was just dealing with what was coming up from him, that this woman was, like, trying to boss him and trying to do all these things and not valuing him. He grieved all these things, which only made his love for me more pure, which maybe, was even... Maybe if I give an example, and perhaps I should stand with yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. If I give an example... Of it, um, shortly after we met, um, we we started to watch occasional movies together, right? And and one movie I remember we were in England, and uh, and one movie was a, a movie about love. You know, I don't think it was a Notebook. I think it was something else. I can't. Remember. And I can't remember the movie actually now. But uh, but Mary rubbished the movie the entire way through the movie, like, uh, and she had this really condescending viewpoint towards love. Uh, and it just struck me that my soulmate was so callous to love, like, um, and and uh, like I, I just felt so much grief about that because because um, I realised at that point that 
that meant that this was going to be a long, a long <laughs> period of time before, before I probably feel any love from her, you know. And, uh, and so I, I went up to my room at the time we were staying with somebody else. And I went up to my room and just cried for a couple of hours. But she eventually came up to the room and heard me crying. <laughs> and, uh, and then she was really angry about me crying about it. So she really was, was swearing and carrying on at me yeah. about crying about her, her uh, feelings about love, you know. And, because uh, keep in mind, in my list, sharing emotions was something that I felt love did. Here's this guy who keeps feeling emotions and I feel responsible. I've got to be, like, I've got to take, I've got to soothe and comfort these emotions out of him. Which and I didn't want. He <laughs> didn't want that. He just wanted to keep feeling and I would just get more and more stressed out. Like, I can't, I can't control this guy. I can't make him happy. And so I just feel like I don't want to feel so terribly responsible. Um, and that was different to actually taking responsibility. I just, I just kind of self-punished about it, which is what I had learnt you do when you're trying to be sorry. Which I would also say something about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. so there was a lot of truth coming my way and a lot of emotion, and I wasn't used to any of it. Um, and well, I can sit down now, can I? So, yeah. no. <laughs> I don't want you going. Um, so this... Maybe just to finish off the list before I move on to the next thing. I wanted, I wanted this barter and I wanted a role. I couldn't get it. It infuriated me. I, I tried to sacrifice. He wouldn't even let me do that. He just wanted me to be me. I didn't want to be me. It was, I didn't like me. It wasn't going to be good if I was just me. You know, I wasn't proud of who I was underneath all this facade and control. Also, Instead of comforting and soothing my emotions, he kept pointing out my emotions and encouraging me towards my emotions. And I didn't want to feel them. I was angry. I was like... And actually, every time I'd start to feel my emotions, they were so big and so overwhelming and confirmed all this stuff about who I was. I, so I would just, like, open up for five minutes, shut down for five months. And I, I was really like a rock, wasn't I? And I was really, really hard. Um, yeah, and he wouldn't let me share his emotions, and so I just wanted him to stop having them. And so I would try to control him feeling with rage. Um, all the while trying to maintain a facade of being a nice, good girl, because, you know, I had a lot of approval for that. So it was very... Um, it was very confusing even for me. And for you, I guess you could always feel the emotions coming out of me but you had to call me on lying a lot of times didn't you where I'd try to be all nice and pleasant and AJ would be like you are raging right now and I would have to go no I'm not raging <laughs> and try to keep it all under wraps I was even terrified to just admit that I was angry um, and and that actually I had all of these things inside of me Letting go of a lot of these things has felt like letting go of the thing that I wanted to use to feel secure in the world. Letting go of a set of armour, letting go of the way I control everything. It's felt really, really scary a lot of times. Um, and as I said, emotionally confronting and letting those things go has taken me time. Like... I have so much compassion for, for my man when he says, yeah, I knew it was going to be a long time. Even the humility that he had in that of he never projected impatience at me. He never projected, would you hurry up? You're hurting me. He never blamed me for the emotions that were being triggered inside of him. And I did the exact opposite. Everything I was feeling, I just blamed him for, you know, and... And again, that's where I get really emotional because that's such a... And I often encourage people when I see them in relationships and things now to just feel what is going on for you. If you can do that, you will become so much clearer with your partner. And as someone who hasn't done that but has received the gift of a partner actually feeling their stuff and becoming clearer and more truthful and more loving with me as a result... It's changed me in a way that I'm not... I'm sure I'm not going to be able to describe to you today properly. But I really would love to because it's such a... a it's a life-changing thing. 
And I feel that this is, this is why I'm so passionate about this path as well, because this is what we can offer to each other, even when we're not in a relationship. To be a presence of real love for another person alters them. It really does. And I feel that I, I, that's how I want to be. And, I, and I'm coming from this place. And, and I feel that if I can do it, we can all do it. Trust me. <laughs> Um, okay, um, so yeah, AJ wouldn't share in my emotions and I wanted him to all the time. Uh, in fact, I wouldn't really feel anything unless he was engaged with me, talking to me about it. And that's because I, I kind of was seeking this comfort and soothing all the time. Also, he wasn't giving me approval in this sort of global way that I was used to from my family. My family had withdrawn all approval from me. In fact, they were raging at me by this stage. And I was craving someone to just say I was a good girl. And this is where I, I got so bamboozled because AJ would be saying to me, I love you. Uh, you know, I just want to be with you. I want you to be yourself and I want us to have a relationship. I want to know you. Um, and I'd love it if you want to know me. But that thing you're doing right there, that's not loving. That's not kind. That's, and I was, I couldn't, I, on one hand, I'm drawn to this feeling of love and acceptance, but there's no approval accompanying it. And I couldn't understand what was going on. I, I felt like, hang on, you don't love me. And I would say to him, you don't even love me. You don't love me. You just love an idea of who I, who I will be one day or who I used to be. You don't love the real me because I felt if you loved the real me, you'd be approving of everything all of the time. Um, and he, he, he wasn't approving. He was pointing things out. Um, yeah, and so that was really... Over time, I've come to understand I just wasn't even sensitive to love. I couldn't really recognise it when it was coming towards me. I could feel drawn to it a little bit, but I couldn't understand that this was being loved, actually, because I'd never experienced that before, this, this acceptance of me and this desire for me, just me. No addictions involved, no barter involved, no needing to present a facade. In fact, rejecting the facade. And I thought my facade was the best bit of me. I really thought that was what I had going for me. And if I dropped that, it, everything would fall to rack and ruin, you know. And thankfully, I can say the reverse is true. <laughs> Anything that we create, is, it can't be as good as what God's created in us, you know. And letting go of all of this big creation and this big story that I had going about myself has been the best thing. And I still, I, of course, I'm still doing it, you know. Um, but the more I do it, the more I feel like, oh, that's a relief. It's hard work to maintain this version of ourselves. Yeah, and of course, he wouldn't meet any of my addictions. <laughs> So I wanted to feel special. I wanted to feel like I had a role. I wanted to feel um, that I had control over men. I didn't want to feel vulnerable. I didn't want to feel unsafe. I didn't want to... So I had all of these addictions going on with everyone around me. And then suddenly I wasn't seeing any of those people because they, they were a bit weirded out by what I was doing. And, or in the case of my family, freaked out and angry. Um, so I was spending a lot of time with AJ and his son Tristan and these guys are really developed guys who don't meet women's addictions. And I felt awkward. I felt like a teenager again. I was like, what do I do? I don't, I, you know, after I got over some anger, I was just like, I, I, it's just me here. I don't know what to do. You know, I'm feeling really kind of scared almost. Not because... <laughs> because they were actually just being kind to me and not demanding anything of me. And I, didn't, I didn't really know how to respond in that situation. I, I've come to realise that I was a master in walking into a situation, feeling everyone in that situation, understanding the person I needed to be and just being that person, and I got a lot of, I got a lot of acceptance that way. It wasn't true acceptance, but sort of approval. And... And when we met, I was really addicted to the world's approval. 
I wanted to be cool and hip and happening and worldly. Uh, you know, wanted to know what was going on out there in the world and have an opinion and, you know, be, be this kind of hip young person. And um, then realising that you're Mary Magdalene kind of and that your soulmate's Jesus takes hip out of the equation. <laughs> So you go from being hip to sort of like, oh, fringe dweller of society um, in a lot of people's eyes. And uh, I had a big tantrum about that, you know. And in a lot of ways, I'm still grieving this idea that, oh, wow, society's not really going to accept me, polis bolus, um, maybe for a long time, maybe not ever. And, um, yeah... So, but in the beginning, I was just raging about it and blaming, 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 blaming. Forget about that it's me and I know it's me and I feel it's me. No, it's you, 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 you know. <laughs> Would you stop it? Would you? And I did a lot of things to try and control the way we lived our life. Don't talk to people. We'd just be at people's house, people who want to talk about divine truth and know that we're saying we're Jesus and Mary Magdalene and they'd ask about our first century lives. I would do everything from just sit in rage, trying to control, with the facade, uh, trying to control him to not talk about it, to distracting. Who wants a cup of tea? Could I get you something? Just change the subject in any way that I could because I was freaking out and I, I just did anything but feel that freak out. I just really tried to control a lot of things going on. Yeah, so... I want to talk about next. I suppose I wanted to talk about the changes that happened in me that I know have happened in me over this period of time um, as a result of being loved, as a result of breaking this pattern and somebody not doing those things with me. And then I, I wanted to talk to you about what actually did happen, how AJ did respond to me and treat me and I suppose it's what I see as what love in action actually looks like and what love in action does and how that feels. So I'll just quickly summarise how I feel this experience has changed me and then get into the real depths of what I really, um, to, to answer your question yesterday I suppose what I felt. All right, was there any other questions about this or anything before I have it up? Just, if it's off, it'll stop all those clickings that are occurring on the sound system. So, I suppose I wanted to talk about this section, how love has changed me because of um, the power I feel that love love has and love has had on me and six years down the track I, I'm very conscious of the changes that I still have to, to make inside of me and the, the injuries that I'm still carrying and the things that are out of harmony with love but um, I'm also very, very aware that this experience of being loved just for myself has, has caused me to grow in a way that I know it's possible because my soulmate has done it without somebody loving him, but to have his love while I'm growing and changing and to have his love be the catalyst a lot of times for my change um, is just the most beautiful gift and I feel it is the most precious way that you can actually grow. Um, so, yeah, let's talk about that. As I said, when we met, I was an angry, rebellious woman. I was proud of the rebel in me. <laughs> I didn't like laws or rules, and I was kind of pretty tough about the fact that, you know, I, I was anti-authoritarian in every way. It might be my earring. No. Um, yeah. Uh, so I, w I went from being a rebel to, and really kind of hating love and feeling it's hip to be cynical about love. I felt like, hey, we all live in the real world. We know that love doesn't really work. Look around us. You know, I had this... And that's a very, very painful feeling that, um, that I was covering over there, this deep disillusionment with 
the power of love and a feeling that evil will win. Um, and having love presented to me and given to me and um, consistently given to me, even when I was fighting it like a, like a really, really angry three-year-old. <laughs> like, or emotionally, I was punching and kicking and screaming and going, just stop it. Um, this love kept coming to me. Uh, and we would split up for five months and I would just get to this point where all these emotions were triggered in me. I couldn't go back to how I was. Um, I felt I couldn't go forward and I would call um, AJ in this distress and just say, look, I, I, I don't get life anymore. I, can't, I don't know. I can't ignore, but I can't go forward. And this love would come towards me again, this total acceptance of who I was and where I was at and reminders of truth and the possibilities. And then I would say, but I can't be in a relationship with you and I can't even talk to you again. And he'd be like, well, that's okay. I can't be in a relationship with you unless you want to be. Uh, I, we can be friends. And, and there was no guilt. There was no uh, emotional projection at me that I was somehow to blame for the pain that he was feeling about the fact that I was continually rejecting him. And so this, this started this process for me of, it's sort of like, it feels like resensitizing to what love is really about. Um, I was so angry at love and so rebellious. And just to, to receive this, this um, feeling continually, I feel like I went through this place because also there was all this truth coming towards me with this love. And I didn't think that truth and love went together. I thought that really love denied truth because truth could be a bit confronting and maybe trigger some pain. And so when the love and truth kept coming together, I fought that a lot. Uh, and then I went through this period where... Emo so I reckon I fought that for about how many years? Maybe two, three Really, in, from my soul's perspective, I was angry about it. And then um, I went through this period of kind of, it wasn't neutrality, but it was saying, hang on, this truth thing is quite valuable. And this wasn't coming from my head now. It was a space I got to inside of me where I went, this is logical to look at truth when we want to love. This is something that we do need to look at. I don't necessarily like it yet, but, I, I, you know, I'm, I can't stop. I, we've got to listen. I want to listen to this. And to now today where I actually feel like, oh, thank you. <laughs> you know, I feel this heartfelt gratitude for the truth that I'm offered with love. And even it's changed my whole attitude to truth. In fact, I can hear truth from people who are maybe not loving and still feel grateful and I can welcome the attractions that come into our life a lot more. So uh, I suppose my attitude, my love has changed my attitude to truth even. Because truth is such a core uh, support of love and a core part of what love does, receiving love and truth together helped me appreciate truth. So... It's also just helped me, as I mentioned, become sensitive to love when it's there and when it's not. Obviously, when we met, I had all this set of ideas of what love does. And when I saw that, I thought that was love. And over this period of time of giving those things up, I've come to feel when people are in that set of addictions, believing that's love and being able to recognise actually that's not love. And it actually feels a bit icky for me now that you want to engage me in something that's not your real self. So I'm beginning to have this sensitivity that AJ had very strongly at the beginning where he was saying, I want you, not this facade and not these addictions and not this barter. Now I feel after six years I'm beginning to have that same feeling for myself. I certainly want it in our relationship. And I, and I want it from others now as well, a lot more. I wouldn't say 100% of the time. Sometimes I still want some addictions met. But, um, or I want to avoid my fear. Let's put it, that's probably more 
truthful. But um, So I'm more sensitive to love when it really exists. I, I was thinking to, um, like Mary now cries at, at a romantic movie. Like, <laughs> so before she was sob. like, yeah. <laughs> so she, she was sob about a romantic movie now, whereas before um, it was just like condescension and ridicule yeah. and rage. And, <laughs> and, and even when I would soften to something, I would get angry at myself, you know? I would see something might move me. It, you know, on TV or in a movie or something, and then I'd be really angry with myself. And I'm a lot softer now to this love. And, and I've, I want people to meet their soulmates. And even though I've gone through this, like, drama of six years, I'm like, no, it's a good thing. You want to meet the other half of you. Like, trust me, it's awesome. Um, and, you know, even three years ago, I was like, oh, you don't want to do this. You know, I had this really yucky feeling in me about love and about the whole soul. And I remember uh, that one time when we were travelling across to the sunny coast and you were just yelling and screaming at God about soulmates and how much you hated the concept and idea. And I felt like I don't have a choice. I want a choice. You know, this doesn't feel good, so I want to be able to choose someone else, and I can't, and I know I can't. I was really angry at God about it. Um, and now I have, I really feel completely differently. I feel like that I have so much gratitude for the way God has designed this system and even this system for us to come to find love uh, and to engage this relationship with God herself to feel what real love is like. Because all of these things that I'm relating, we all try to do this barter and sacrifice and all this other stuff, we try to do it with God as well, don't we? Uh, we feel like we have to be good enough for God and then God will love us and we try a bit harder and all this stuff and it's not really how God feels. God feels it a lot of the same ways that I'm going to describe to you in the next session that, that AJ does, except, of course magnified uh, a lot more. So it's even more powerful to engage that relationship. Marina? Um, okay. I have a question about soulmates. Yep. Um, I guess in my own experience, I feel that I knew my soulmate when I was a young child, and then I went through about two decades of not being with my soulmate and having relationships that were easier in a lot of ways. And then I feel that I, I reconnected with my soulmate. The man who I feel is my soulmate. But my question is, I feel a lot of feelings about like lost time missed. Um, and of course, unfortunately, all of the, one of the biggest issues that I feel that exists is the feeling of like what I used to do and who I was and who I'm not and all of that. Um, I guess maybe in, in you your... mean a lot of the feelings you used to have about being with other guys. Uh, yeah, sleeping with other men and not being with just that one person that God designed for us to be with. Um, and I don't know maybe in your experiences because you guys have like a lot of years worth of emotions that you felt through. Um, I just feel so much like this, even like a fear of loss of like losing it again, and yeah. I don't do the right thing, and I feel that I'm totally not loving because. It's like your soul is open up to meet your soulmate and then all this other shit is in the fucking way and then it just doesn't, it's never like clear like that. So I just have like a lot of issues about um, this emotion about what's lost and the lack of love that exists between two people and I feel really bad about that. Yeah, sometimes. Marina, I can totally relate to that feeling. Like, I... I have a lot of grief inside of me, even about the way I've responded in the last six years. I feel really sad about that. But I have a lot of feelings of grief about it. I often say now to AJ, I wish you'd just come and found me when I was 16. And when I had, back when I was in my, you know, early to mid-teens, I had some feelings about wanting just one guy. And, you know, I didn't want to sleep with any other guy. I just wanted this one guy. And... It kind of, I just 
got on this other bandwagon of wanting to be cool and wanting to be hip and wanting to be, uh, you know, I thought that, that I judged that part of myself so strongly. And so I spent a lot of years and had other relationships and ones that I feel I could have felt better about if I felt they were based in some real love, but they, they weren't and I can't kid myself about that. But I feel the th only thing for us to do is grieve these things. I mean, it, it's as easy as that, just to soften to the sadness that you have about that. And when you're talking about having things in the way, that's the major thing in the way, you know, the shame and the grief that we have about those things. And God doesn't feel judgment at you about those things. God has a lot of compassion for you about how those things came about, you know, and is... She's just waiting for you to soften to let those things go. And, and I'm very fortunate to have a soulmate who doesn't judge me about those things either. Um, and that's very powerful for me as well, you know, that a lot of the things that I have done, if he had done them, <laughs> I would judge them in him. And I see that as a big issue in, at, just currently at the moment, you know, uh, because of the feeling that I feel... Underneath all that arrogance and bravado that I used to have, I don't feel that good about myself. And so if my soulmate had done a lot of the things that I had done, like slept around, and even during this time, during this six years, I'm at one stage we broke up and I started dating another guy. You know, I was that angry and that much like I'm moving on. Um, and I was sexually projecting at other men a lot and there was not this sexual fidelity in our relationship that, um, that is forming now, really. True fidelity is forming from my... Not from his side, but from me, you know. And um, he, he has felt through all... And this is another thing about what real love does. Instead of blaming me for all of those things... Um, I've observed AJ be humble to the pain that he's had about them and to the point where now he, he's not pained by them and can, can love me th through them and help me with them, actually, help me with what has driven those things. And I suppose for myself at the moment and the opportunity that you have as well at the moment is to really grieve through these things and desire humility enough that instead of feeling inside of ourselves that we would judge our partner if they had done that, to know that we would feel about those things because we desire to love them more than we desire to just make ourselves feel better about ourselves. Like my judgment of him in that situation would be because I don't want to feel how his actions might be triggering this feeling that, I have, that I'm bad, you know, that I don't feel good. And in fact, that was a lot of the feelings that were triggered by you, wasn't it, when I was in that situation. I was thinking though for Marina, there are some other issues that Mary doesn't have that you have. And, and you know, you, you did choose a life of addiction and, and the reason why you were quite unhappy in, your, in finding your soulmate again is because those addictions are still present and there is an unwillingness in you to address them you want to see them as his problem rather than your own. And so, you know, that, that is an issue that you're going to face, you know, coming face to face with the fact that you have quite a number of addictions that you need to face and, and that, and that he, he doesn't and shouldn't meet them, in fact. <laughs> um, he doesn't <laughs> yeah. a lot of the time. <laughs> and, and, and he shouldn't meet them. If he loves you, he shouldn't meet them. Um, he... Like the, it is a difficult thing because oftentimes people do meet their soulmates in their childhood. That 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 is a reality, but most of the time are not um, don't enter any any form of long term relationship with them because of the addictions that are present within the person that they want to go and out into the world and get fulfilled, and and that is going to be a problem when you meet again, because naturally you're still going to have all those addictions in you. And so you're going to have to work your way through them. And, uh, and you have that opportunity to do that. But not, it's not a guarantee you will, because you could just get fed up with it and go out and get some addictions met again. Do you know what I mean? So it really depends on your choice. And this is something that 
myself and Mary have discussed frequently with each other about making more loving choices, choosing to make more loving choices, even though you know that it, or that it feels more painful sometimes to do so. Um, and the only reason why it feels more painful to make a loving choice is because you're full of addictions that are telling you you don't want to make the more loving choice. That's the main reason why it happens. So a lot of the emotions you're facing are stuff that Mary now has worked through to a large degree. Uh, you know, those things that Mary mentioned in the first board she wrote down are pretty much many of the emotions you feel about what a relationship should do. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not how God sees a relationship at all. God sees a relationship as a gift. A person has the option to give you the gift and, and they have free will. They are allowed to choose to how they wish to do that. And that doesn't mean that they will choose infidelity or choose, you know, to have other sexual people sexually in their lives or any of those things, because that, that would mean that they don't, they themselves are injured in a way that, you know, that they see love. But the key is to work through all of your addictions about that. So, so I had to work through, so if, if Mary did date somebody else, I had to work through the feeling feelings that that caused me to have rather than just projecting them all at Mary. Does that make sense? And rather than telling, rather than sort of saying, we get a lot of people going to us, my soulmate should do this and he should have done that and he should have done this and I don't like him anymore because he's, <laughs> and, and I don't feel that way with Mary. Like I love her no matter what she chooses to do. I love the fact that she wants to grow and she wants to change, she wants to become more truthful and more loving. Um, but when there were times when her, her addictions or other emotions uh, or the denial of other emotions yeah. caused her to not do those things, I, uh, you know, I didn't feel like she has to or anything like that. I just felt like I've got to deal with some more things <laughs> there about that and then just be patient and work through my feelings about that. That's all I have control over, my own feelings. And though I long for Mary's love, um, I don't project at her an expectation or demand for it. Does that make sense? And, I, and during that time, I'm completely se sexually faithful as well. Like, so I don't see, if Mary wants to have a relationship with somebody else, I don't decide in my anger or something to go off and have a relationship with somebody else until she comes back, you know. My feelings are, no, I know who I want. I don't want anybody else. Uh, in fact, it's impossible for me to have a sexual relationship with anyone else. And, uh, and so I don't feel like I want one. Um, so she could choose to leave me for 20 years if she wanted to and have children and all everything else, but I, I still wouldn't do anything else. Um, may I ask a question about children soulmates? Sure. Um, ex what are the emotions that go on exactly? Being that a child's law of attraction is sort of managed by the parents, well, when soulmates meet as children, does this have to do with the parents' openness and or... The, the souls being attracted to each other to begin with? Well, the, the souls of... God's created us to meet at a very young age, actually. And for, as I said, for many people, they do meet their soulmates during their childhood or their teenage years. Um, so, and a lot of times it's got very little to do with the parents' openness. It's got a lot more to do with, uh, with how strong the soul is drawing the other half of it, itself to itself. Uh, which is how God created it to be. Um, sometimes, Marina, you want answers to questions that are just as they are. It's almost like you want there to be a reason behind everything. So at the moment, what's happening is emotionally, you're looking for a reason why you did not engage the relationship from childhood onwards. Does that make sense? In the sense of the soulmate relationship. And the reasons are quite simple but you don't want the answer. The reason is you had addictions that you weren't going to have met by your soulmate at the time, and so you decided to go and get them met somewhere, somewhere else. And, and the thing you're resisting is coming face to face with that. Does that make sense? Yeah. You want it to be some cosmic uh, <laughs> alternative, you know, some plan of God or plan of some other alternative plan that's caused that to occur. And it's not. It's just a, a factor of choices. And this is what we talked about yesterday with regard to responsibility. We need to see our personal responsibility for our own choices. 
the reason why you have pain about not making those particular choices, you just need to feel that pain because it's of your own creation. It's not anybody else's fault that, that you decided to do those things. Does that make sense? That's like, it feels like this like never-ending pain. Well, like it's not a never-ending pain. It's not a never-ending pain. When you own it for yeah. yourself and you realise that it's of your own creation, then it will end. But at the moment, you want somebody else to blame for that pain. Him or somebody else. Oh, yeah, totally. <laughs> and, uh, and that's not going to be very nice towards him. But, but also, it's not, uh, you know, nice towards anybody else to blame other people for the, for the results of your own decisions. Well, thank you. All right. I want to wrap up this list because I'm really keen to just get on to the, what love in action looks like and what I observed here. So, um, yeah, just that love has changed me. I'm happier. I've got more self-esteem than I had in the past. I feel grateful for the gifts. I feel grateful for real gifts, not just uh, people meeting my addictions. Um, and I actually probably value our whole soul more than I value this half or, or as much as I value this half and a lot more than I value my fear. When we met, I valued my fear above all things and um, hence me trying to control the way we lived our life, the, how open we were about who we were, all of these kinds of things. And... Recently, we had this experience where we went to England um, to be on the telly uh, in England, uh, on live TV, prime time, all of this kind of thing. And I was freaking out. Um, but for the first time, I had a really different soul response. And that response was, God's brought me something that I obviously need to deal with because <laughs> my emotions are telling me I'm freaking out. Also, I really want what's best for our whole soul here. I, and I know that dealing with my fear will, be be, will improve our whole soul. And also, I don't want to suppress what the other half of me really wants to do anymore. If this is important to him, I want to do it as well. Um, and I also acknowledge that he's far more through his fear than I am on this issue. So his leadership or his desire can take leadership here. And I will just simply feel about it. And this was a revelation for me that I actually responded in that way without having to work at it. I actually felt like, no, great, thanks God, I'm freaked out, let's do this. I want him to be himself, I'm not going to try and control it passively or actively anymore. And actually I'm going to do my best to be myself. What happened? How did, how did we get to this bit? <laughs> um, and actually, it, it went pretty well. And yes, God brought me a whole set of other things that I need to look at uh, in that experience. But it was certainly a lot more harmonious between the two of us, and that felt awesome. So that's probably... Uh, there's, there's so much I could add to that list, but I feel the more important thing is probably just to talk about what love in action really looks like and what I observe day to day, um, not just in the way that I'm treated, but in the way that this individual treats everyone. Yeah. So let's get on to that. Unless you want to add anything or anyone has any questions. Yeah? Hi. Hi. Um, I run into a lot of situations where, like, we have a confrontation of some sort, and while I'm trying to be honest, trying being the key word, <laughs> yeah. um, I feel like I come around to the, a resolution that seems honest, and then I'm not satisfied with the outcome because I'm not kicking myself in the process. So I just keep going around and around until I drive myself nuts. How do you get the voices in your head to shut up? <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel in, within your question, there's a lot of information. When you say, <laughs> I'm trying to be honest, there's no such thing. You know, you're either honest or you're not. And a lot of times when I am trying to be honest or I'm confused, oh, what's really going on here? And, oh, I've just got to get it right so I can... It's usually because I'm afraid to be really honest. 
and I generate all this clutter in my head of is it this, is it that, is it... Or, because I'm just afraid to really acknowledge what it is I feel right then. And it doesn't have to be the full answer to the whole situation, but what in a relationship, I feel like um, part of my love for my partner would dictate that I'm just honest with him about what I feel right now. Oh, that's going to get me in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> that's what you perceive. You think this... You know, so many times I have felt like, right, shit. <laughs> I'm going to have to be honest about this thing that I feel right now. This is, this, we can't recover from this point. This is it. It's all over. I can't even, I can't even, it's so big a deal for me to even acknowledge that I have this feeling. And now I'm going to say it to the person that I really, really want to love me. Um, and, I, you know, obviously I'm still not trusting that he loves me. I just, I'm so afraid I'm going to lose this love in this moment. And I've said it. And it hasn't always just been like, oh, it's all okay. But honestly, these are the things that have brought us closer together. This is how the soul works and how any relationship works. The whole universe we live in responds to truth, you know. And acknowledging the truth about ourselves is the only way we can grow. And so you having the courage to just be yourself with this person who wants to be closer to you, it can really bring you closer together. And we make these excuses that, oh, you know, it, oh, I'm going to be in trouble and it's going to be the end of the world. And honestly, when I look, the biggest trouble was when I was trying to not do this thing, this honesty thing with my whole heart, you know. That's when we had the most pain and the most drama and the most conflict and the most fights. Now that we, we both want honesty between each other, there's a lot more love growing and there's a lot more closeness, you know. Your partner can feel when you're not being honest. You can feel when your partner's not being honest with you. In your gut, you can feel it. And how, how can you... That's always there in your relationship, always. And so this, and we make excuses, oh, yeah, but I could, they, we couldn't tell him that. I couldn't, I couldn't be that honest. I couldn't be that, expose myself that much. But really, if there's someone who really wants to know you and love you, they're going to love it. They might have their own emotions to feel about it, but ultimately they will respond to that. Do you want to add something to that, babe? Um, I suppose I should get up to do yes, that yeah. rather than sit in. Um, I feel you're ignoring some fairly basic things, though. One is you're very angry. <laughs> um, I'll just... Uh, up. You're very angry, yeah? And very resistive to change and growth. And while you don't acknowledge the rage, you're not going to feel it. And if you don't feel the rage, it's never going to let you go. More it's like I'm trying not to go off at everybody at every moment. But you feel like going yeah. off. <laughs> so you, you really need a baseball bat and a punching bag and, and, and just, you know... Really? Well, I, I gave Mary a baseball bat, punching bag, a, a hose... I had a tennis racket tennis from racket the road. It's on lightweight. The road. You can uh, bash a pillow. Because a tennis racket is quite silent. You can do it on a pillow, you know, in a hotel room. Bang, bang, bang. And, um, we have a nice collection. Yeah. <laughs> but, but really, you're not engaging that process yet. You, you, you're, hitting, you're hitting the area that Mary hit six years ago, which is this rage rebellion towards everything that God wants you to do in the end. And... And you're going, I'm not going there, I'm not going there, I'm not going. But I'll try to be truthful and I'll try to be loving and I'll try to be this. Um, and, and unfortunately what happens when we are like that is that the feelings that we truly have, which are anger, will stay within us until you release them. That's the thing you need to learn, is that until you release a feeling, it will remain with you. It will remain with you. And, and so... Unless you acknowledge that you're angry and then allow the release of the anger itself, not at your partner. Yeah, but, please don't mistake my being honest. Not at yeah. anybody else. Um, I just used to encourage me, you're angry now. Uh, I used to love when Mary's angry. Was like, you're angry now? Go and go for it, you know? Like, <laughs> and sometimes she'd be angry at me saying that, but rarely, most of the time, she would just go and go for it. 
And a lot of people are very uncomfortable uh, allowing themselves to feel the level of rage that's within them. Yeah. But until you feel that, you won't feel the addiction that drives it. So there's addictions that drive every bit of rage you feel. Every time you feel rage, it's an addiction not being met, and you want it met. Right? And, and so until you feel your rage, you won't actually get to feel your addiction. And you need to feel your addictions. God wants you to feel every addiction you have, because without feeling it, you're never going to release it. Yay. Does that make sense? <laughs> so God wants you to feel every addiction you have and actually feel it. Not, not project it at the world and want the world to satisfy it, but actually feel it. When you feel every addiction you have, you will feel every fear that drives every addiction you have. Does that make sense? And, and once you feel every fear that drives every addiction, you will release the fear and therefore you will have no addictions and no rage as a result. But until you feel these emotions like these layers, um, you can do it any amount of intellectual gymnastics you want and nothing is going to change. Nothing will change. And you'll just get more frustrated, more angry, more upset with the world, more upset with God, more upset with your partner, more upset with yourself. And, and, and in the end, what you finish up doing is creating almost your own nightmare for yourself by resisting the emotion that's just present. So it's much simpler, as we've talk, discussed many times, myself and Mary, it's much simpler to feel the emotion that's present at the time without damaging anybody else around you, feel the emotion that's present at the time and allow its release. Then you get to the next set of emotions that drive that. That's the, that's the best way to deal with it every time. Now, you don't want to do that. <laughs> you don't want to. You know? And that's okay, but you are not going to change until you want to do that. I'm also concerned about innocent bystanders. So <laughs> you what, sorry? Innocent bystanders. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you're that afraid of that, to be honest. Uh, no, it, like in, inanimate objects we later will have to Yeah, use. well, inanimate <laughs> objects, they, they are fine. You know, you can hurt as many of them as you want. Uh, <laughs> it's the people and, the, and animals and other things that are living that you don't want to hurt, right? Yeah. And uh, I feel like a lot of times you avoid just saying... I'm angry because you don't want to take responsibility for the anger. So you're creating this whole other... This, and when I said to be honest with Boris, I'm not saying you should dump your rage on him. No, but to and say... And that's not honest either. Because it, by right. dumping your rage on another person, you're actually being dishonest. You're blaming the other person for what's inside of you. That's yeah. dishonest. I usually dishonest. wind up waiting until I bubble over and... Yeah, don't, I mean, don't yeah. wait till you bubble over. You just... Yeah. What, what, like, yeah, you know, you've got crockery in your house, yes? Like, yeah. Plenty. Yeah, well, you know, it's all inanimate stuff. It doesn't matter if it all gets destroyed in the process of you dealing with some rage. And then actually what happens is... Boris will eat off plastic plates. He doesn't yeah, care. There's less even, rage. He might even go out and buy a whole set of plastic plates just, to, just so he's got something to eat on. But, but the bottom line is that if you can address the emotions you feel... Um, and feel them in the moment, it, it makes for a much simpler life. And this is something that, particularly in Western society, we have very little understanding of. We, we have created huge facades that we're trying to live every single day. Often there's huge amounts of emotion underneath those facades, and yet we're trying to deny them all the time and, uh, and trying to be good, you know, trying to be... But, but like I said to Mary many times, like... Feel the emotion. When you feel the emotion, it's released. Once it's released, it's done. You don't have to worry about it anymore. It's gone. And then you get to feel the addiction underneath and then you get to feel your fear. You're, it's your fear driving you. You're, you're actually quite terrified. Yeah, yeah. And anybody who's quite terrified gets very angry when they deny their terror. That's yeah. the reality. And, and so look at your resistance to your terror. That's also, that'll help you with your rage. Does that make sense? It will help with you, you with your anger. Rage dissipates every time you acknowledge its cause, and its cause is always fear. And what I've noticed here in the States, we've pointed out fear to quite a number of people already since we've been here, and most people here are totally detuned from the level of fear they are in. You know, you have a whole society and a way of life that detunes you 
from how much fear you actually feel, collectively and individually. Your entire comfort-based lifestyle is all about detuning from the levels of fear that you have. And if you look at how you respond here, you know, in your society towards war, you know, you're prepared to go to war very rapidly in this society in order to protect you from your fears. Uh, that's really what it's about. It's about your fear. And there's huge amounts of fear here in the States. Most people in the States are completely detuned from it, completely detuned from it. And this is what causes your anger. That's why when you go to a place like New York or something like that, it's renowned for how angry everybody is all the time. Right? <laughs> yeah. And that's because of the level of fear that everybody is existing in that they deny within themselves all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And you think at the moment that it's really, really confronting and hard to acknowledge this anger and addictions and fear. But, and I know that's where I was six years ago. But actually life becomes simpler and you like yourself more when you get more real about yourself. And because you, often, and I was very unaware of this myself, I was projecting all this rage out at everyone, trying to control, control, control. And in the end, this just added to me feeling like bad about myself, you know, because I could feel it's not very nice. I really want to do it, but it's not very nice. And coming to own my rage, even just owning your rage and saying, look, I'm angry. And we would have conversations where I would be like, I just really want you to meet my addiction right now. I just really want you... I can feel what I want from you and you're not giving it to me. And just even having that level of awareness helped so much. And it, it helped both me and I think it helped you and it helped growth. So you don't have to do it all overnight, but while you keep making excuses for yourself and saying, oh, I, I, can't, I can't be that honest, right? I can't just own up to when I'm a bit irritated because then, you know, I'll have to take responsibility for it. Um, you, you're delaying a process that inevitably you're going to... Yeah, <laughs> yeah you, you won't be able to avoid it anymore. And yeah. most women are very afraid, very afraid of a lot of things. You know, they're very afraid sexually of a lot of things because historically women have not been treated well. Um, and so there is a lot of not only fear in the current generation, but fear that's been passed down from previous generations. There's a lot of issues in most women about security, both financial and otherwise. And there are a lot of issues in most women about control, wanting control. And, and so these are all fears. And this is why most women get very, very angry when they're faced with divine truth, because the reality is there's a lot of fear that gets triggered, but they don't want to feel. They, and they've created a comfort-based lifestyle, and they've even been attracted to the man they're with oftentimes and, and, the, the, and the situation they live in in order to avoid all their fears. Uh, and, and so when somebody starts confronting those fears, they get angry and upset, you know. And your husband wants to change himself. That's automatically going to confront a lot of your fears. Automatic, because you're going to worry... Now, is he going to love you after he changes? You know, is he going to care for you after he changes? Is he going to want to help provide for your circumstances after he changes? The, none of these things are a given, in, and particularly once a person changes, you don't know whether they're going to still want to do all of those things, right? And so in the end, the, usually what happens is the person who's feeling the opposite on the other end of that relationship straight away goes into resistance straight away goes into anger resistance trying to prevent the process of change and there's no in that place there's really no confidence in love no trust no faith in love you know that if your husband truly loves you then the change will be quite easy no matter what happens does that mean so even if he's not your soulmate it, it will the change will still be quite easy and um, if he loves you through the process and if you choose love through the process then it will all be quite easy but Oftentimes we don't do that. We're so freaked out about what we're worried about, we then choose to rebel. And once we choose rebellion, 
then we're against all of God's laws, we're against all the principles of love, we're against all the principles of truth. Inside of ourselves, we're basically saying, I don't want any of it, I don't, I don't want you to change, I don't want me to change, I don't, you know, I don't want anything, you just shut up now, I don't want to hear any more of this. And you, 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 know, you just go into this place where you just want to rebel against everything and you want every, the person you're with to go exactly back to exactly where they were so that you can go back to where you were. And, and to be honest, it's not very realistic because God, if you want a relationship with God, you're going to be constantly changing and uh, constantly growing. Therefore, constantly you will have different opinions and so will the other half of yourself. So he will have, start have, to have different opinions too. And, and if you can't love each other through that process and honour the process, then you're going to find life very difficult anyway, no matter who you're with and what's happening. You're going to find life very difficult. So this is what I'd recommend to most women is to, to start confronting these fears that actually create all of these demands to have your addictions met that then cause a lot of your anger when they don't get met. And a lot of people are in passive-aggressive rages about this, but you're an aggressive one. And actually, <laughs> it's better to be in an aggressive one than a passive-aggressive one because a passive-aggressive one is just more suppression. Right? So be in a rage about it if you want to be in a rage about it, but stop blaming God, your partner, and, and others, and even yourself, for the feelings you have and just choose to feel the feelings and get to the addictions and the fear that are under them. Yeah. When you get to the fear and you honour your fears, you'll find all of your rage will disappear. You won't, you won't have any rage anymore. You'll just feel terrified every time one of your addictions isn't met. You won't feel angry anymore about it being, not being met. Does that make sense? Thank you. Thanks. Boris, did you want to ask something? Yep. And uh, just COVID it quite so. Yep. Uh, everything is hit home. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I, I find myself like, basically, it's uh, um, on the other other end of the, of it. Other end of it. Yep. Um, I have a desire to assist her in the process. Um, it's also mixed with my desire to uh, avoid angry women. <laughs> yeah. um, so in other words, it's not really an assistance yeah. of her in the process. Yep. It's an addiction inside of you trying to avoid an angry woman yes. by helping her to yes. get over her anger. Yes. Right? Yes. And that's not love. Exactly. Yeah. Right? Love yeah. would actually assist her to connect with the reasons why she's angry yep. and uh, allow her to, through the process of dealing with that. Yeah. So I, I go through periods of recognizing that. Yeah, good. And I try not to not to do that. Yeah. Um, uh, but there's still the feeling in you. You see, yeah. until mm -hmm. until you feel the feeling as to why you're trying to prevent her from being angry, mm -hmm. you're going to have a soul-based feeling projected at her, going, "I want you to stop being angry now." You know, like yeah. constantly, and and then that's going to feel like a judgment as well. So so yeah. then the person feels, gets more yeah. angry <laughs> generally because they're being judged as well. It's far better if you can uh, deal with the emotion inside of you as to how freaked out you are when a woman gets angry. Because yep. that means you don't get a lot of things from her. You don't get approval, acceptance. You don't get probably much sexual attention uh, or any of those kind of Great. things either during that period. And that, you know, usually stresses most men out quite significantly. So allow yourself to go through those emotions. That would be the best way to help her. Yep. But at the moment, and this is ha applies to many of the men who are here, they want to help the woman through her emotions only to prevent their own. Exactly. Yeah. And that's not going to do... But I do, I do realise that when I allow her to express her anger at me, even though I realise it's not a, not a loving act, I know that the, after this has happened, um, it confronts a lot of things inside of me and helps me release quite a few things. Yeah, see, I don't allow Mary to express her anger to me. That's, that's where I'm confused. I allow her to express her anger generally about yeah. what the issue is about, but as soon as she starts projecting it at me, I go, no, this is not on now. I'm out the door. Yeah. Like, you're not doing this yeah. to me. That's why I'm having trouble I'm recognizing blame. whether I'm, I'm trying to shut her down because of my own fears or... Um... Well, you, you will be trying to shut her down because of your own fears because you are not dealing with them. So the actions that you take will be affected by that emotion coming out of your soul until you desire to feel them. Yeah. 
But I, but I also think it's important for you to realise yeah. that it doesn't matter what your emotions are, actually, or hers. All that matters is what is the truth from God's perspective. What is the truth from God's perspective? If somebody is blaming you for something in their life, they're out of line. Simple as that. It doesn't matter how bad you feel saying that or how hard it is to say that to a person. They are out of line. You should not be blamed for something that's happening inside of her. You should also not blame her for something that's happening inside of you. Right? And whenever you do that, you're out of line. And, and, and if you honour the truth in that moment, you will pick up yourself as easily as you pick up the other person. Right? So I feel that's part of the problem in relationships is that one party always wants to help the other, right? Or blame the or other. Or blame the other yep. for what they're doing. And this often happens both sides, right? But, but nobody in the relationship is often focused on what is God's truth about what's happening right now? What is God's truth about what's happening right now? Right now, if Mary's angry with me and dumping her anger on me, unless I have actually been responsible for what happened. In other words, I did something to her, to hurt her. Like, I'm, like if, I, if I was an abusive man, I might have hit her, and then she's angry with me. Well, that, I would understand her anger under those circumstances, but if she's angry with me and I've done nothing, and all, all I've done is worked in harmony with God's love and truth up until that point... And triggered a fear in And me. triggered a fear in Mary. There is no reason for her to be angry with me. She can be angry about the fear being that she wants to deal with. Now, I'm perfectly happy with that. When Mary gets angry and connects to the fear and her denial of the fear, and I'm, I'm okay totally with that. But as soon as she's angry with me, no, that's it. No, you can't be angry with me. I'm not to blame for what's happening inside of you. So you can't be angry with me. And I certainly went from this place of wanting to blame, 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 blame. And initially for a little while, AJ accepted that and because he wanted me to love him and he wanted other things to happen. Not only that, I had internal emotions where I did feel I was to blame. Like uh, the feeling I had actually was my very existence was cause for her to blame me. That was the actual depth of my unworthy feelings. I felt that just by existing I was bad enough. And because of things that happened in the first century as well, you felt that, didn't you? Yeah. But then when you worked through that, there was this very definite line of like, yeah, you can be angry, but I'm not to blame here. And, and I still wanted to blame for a long time. But then I got to this point where I realised, ah, anger, that's mine. <laughs> you know, this anger is in me. And even though this situation is... I, I want to be angry at him. I would just say, I'm so angry right now. I've got to go. <laughs> you know, and I just... Go sometimes and... Mary didn't do that and Mary's go yelling and screaming at me. I'm saying, no, I'm firm. I stay in the situation. I don't generally leave it. I just go, no, this is not on now. Like, I'm firm. No, this is not on now. You, what you're doing now is denying. I, and I always generally try to point out to her, if I know, because sometimes you might not, but, but most of the time I do know what Mary's going through and therefore know what's cause of her anger. I said, babe, this is not about... This is not about what you think it's about. It's about you're terrified of this. And as soon as she hears that, generally Mary's quite connected emotionally now. She starts crying straight away. Right? As to, yeah, you know, that's the acknowledgement, if you like, of the terror that she's feeling at the time. So it's always usually a fear that causes rage. And so um, I can, if I point out the fear, Mary's straight away into her emotions generally about that particular fear. Now, but if Mary decided, no, she wasn't even going to do that, she's just going to get more angry... I say, darling, you and I need to split up now. Because oh, I don't want to be with an angry woman who's blaming me for the fears that's inside of her all the time. I don't want to be with that woman. I want to be with a woman who's, who's got the courage to address her fears, just like I expect myself to have the courage to address my own. And so, you know, I'm, I'm not willing to feed the rage by being present in it and being projected at me but I'm also willing to try to help Mary and help myself understand what's really going on in terms of the depth, the, the cause of it. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and this is some of the stuff that I want to talk about in the next section about how AJ has always been willing to honour the truth of a situation above what he might feel about it. Like by saying we can't be in a relationship anymore, which has happened. I don't, I don't want that. Um, 
He doesn't want that. He feels there's really a lot of grief about that. But he knows that the truth in this situation is more important than what he's going to feel as a result. And yeah, acting yeah. in harmony with God's laws and God's love ultimately will bring about the best for everyone in the situation. But it, it, it might cause some short-term pain. Yeah. yeah. And in particular, I'm very concerned if I feel from the other person a feeling that they are not going to address this issue. You know, if they, you know how you can feel from a person when they're just stubborn on the issue and that's it, they're not going to address it. So, so for example, if there's like, like I notice it a lot with sexual issues between partners. Um, either the husband or the wife doesn't want to address the particular sexual issue. So for, I see it a lot with uh, what we attract. It seems to be a lot of women who are very resistive to being open sexually to their partners, for example. And, and what I see is a ve definite feeling, and I can feel the definite feeling in those women many times, they are not going to address that issue. They are not going to address the reason why they cannot be openly sexually expressive in their relationship. And, and oftentimes I see a husband who cares about them deeply, wants that sexual expression and all those kind of things, but the woman says, no, I'm not going to go there. Now, if, if I was living in that situation with Mary, I would just say, darling, until you want to address this particular situation, we cannot be together. Because I don't want to be in a relationship with a person who doesn't want to address something within themselves that they know is a problem. I don't want to be in a relationship with I want to be in a relationship with somebody, whether my soulmate or not, <laughs> I want to be in a relationship with somebody who's willing to address every issue to help us both get closer to God. Every issue. No matter how stressful it is, no matter how difficult it is, no matter how confronting it is, no matter how afraid of it I am or how afraid of it she is, I would like both of us to have the courage to get to that point where we're willing to address everything. And, and I feel if one half of the, the relationship does not want to have the same desire, you're going to struggle having a relationship, to be frank. Because if you want to grow and the other person doesn't want you to grow and doesn't want themselves to grow, it's going to become more and more of a struggle for a relationship to continue. So what we need is to have both have the same attitude about growth, that we both want it. We both want to be closer to God. We both want to be even be closer to each other, that we're willing to address every reason why. Yeah, and I was just going to point out um, that you have that feeling for yourself, inside of yourself. and Before I met Mary, I had that feeling. Yes, but we often encounter couples who want their partner to do it, but they're not necessarily willing to do it themselves. Yeah. You should really deal with this issue, and you're not dealing with it, and you should, and you should, and you should, but they're not actually doing it. So there's got to be a level of ethics within the relationship where if you're asking something of your partner, are, are you willing to do that yourself. for yourself about your same, the same issues that you're in, that what you're having? What we observe, many people who hear divine truth initially, they feel quite passionate about it. They understand there's a you need to deal with certain emotions. And you know what they do then? They become so arrogant that they expect their partner to do it all first before they do it. <laughs> and a lot of times their partner has not even heard of divine truth <laughs> at this point. And yet, all of a sudden, the, par the partners, all these things are being demanded of their partner. Like, you've got to do this, you've got to do that, you've got to do this, you've got to, oh, I'm not going to be there unless you do that. And, and basically, you're saying to your partner, just because you've heard divine truth, you're basically saying to your partner, I'm better than you. And you've got to fix yourself up first. And that is a very arrogant place, I feel. And I've never displayed that kind of arrogance with Mary. Like, I don't see, uh, like, I don't see Mary as less than myself. Right? And I've never expected Mary to change. Right? Obviously, if she wants to have a relationship with me, there's change that's going to occur. But I have never expected her to do it. I've never told her she has to do it you know, in, ter in terms of with the rest of her life. And I'm not going to be with her if she doesn't do it. The only time that I draw a line in the sand is when there is the projection at me that I have to do what she wants... Or there is the projection that me, that she is not going to address a certain issue that would benefit us both. That you have to put up with the issue. And that I have to put up with the issue. That's not love. If, you, if, I, 
expect Mary to put up with something that I do that I know in my heart is wrong and out of harmony with love and yet I expect her to put up with it. I'm not loving her. I'm not caring for her. And if she expects me to put up with things that she knows inside of herself are out of harmony with love, then she's not loving me. Right? And, and so in the relationship, basically what we've done is focused on, okay, do we both firstly have the same desire to grow? Do we both have the same desire to be close even? Because quite often in a relationship when you begin this process, one party wants to be closer than the other party. Or what we notice happening a lot is the woman wants the man to be close to her, but he, she doesn't want to be sexually close and she doesn't want to have an open heart and she doesn't, you know, she, she just wants all these things from him without having to do anything herself. And these are very unloving emotions that are projected at the other party. Yeah, or people, um, we also attract a fair few um, couples where men actually want to be close to the women but they actually it's they want to be mothered and they want to be looked yeah. after and they they want to be pandered to mothered cared for you know cooked for cleaned for basically wiped their bum for <laughs> and you know basically that's what many of them like because that's what they've grown up with in their childhood with their own mothers right and and so quite often we see these imbalances that are occurring We've recently done a, uh, started a series of uh, frequently asked questions called partner relationships. And uh, my suggestion to anybody who wants to improve their relationship with each other is to have a look at some of those questions. And, and in the end, Very I think there's powerful. a couple of hundred questions that yeah. we've been asked, but we've started by looking at the basics of a relationship and what needs to be worked on in the relationship in terms of love. And uh, I think most of you would probably enjoy having a good look at those particular... It'll probably be fairly confronting, but it's a... <laughs> I enjoy doing them very much. Yeah. yeah. And many of you who do not have a relationship are actually avoiding relationships for a lot of reasons. So I would suggest that you have a good look at those particular FAQs just to see what you're avoiding <laughs> with regard to you know, developing love in a relationship. We actually yeah. talk in there about what you can do if you're not in a relationship to prepare yourself to be a, a loving partner in a relationship, so. I'm just conscious of the time, though. What is the time? It's one o'clock. Um, I'm just wondering whether we have the break now and then you go on to... Yeah, I don't want to uh, hog all the time. I just... I would love to just briefly go over the points about love in action that I see you enacting that I often see people miss <laughs> or misunderstand. Yeah. So if you'd like to hear about that after the break, I'm to yeah? I, I'm, okay. okay, yeah. So that's what we'll do after a break. Yeah. So if we could have a, is a half an hour long enough for you guys or do you need a, yep, half an hour long enough? Thank you. Um, is it related to? To what we were just talking about? Well, I think everybody's sort of now detuned for the break. Yeah, so probably, let's, let's could have you a hold break. on to it and ask it after the? There'll be the opportunity for questions after yeah. the break. Yeah.